I think we left off at the very beginning of chapter four of Two Towers. I know we're way behind in, I don't know what we're gonna do to catch up. Um, page 463, Mary and Pippin go inside the forest And this is Fangorn Forest, right? And <clears throat> they go up on this little hill-like thing. And Pippin makes the statement, I'm afraid this is only a passing gleam, and it will all go gray again. What a pity. The shaggy old forest looks so different in the sunlight. I almost felt I liked the place. And then they hear this strange voice say, almost felt you liked the forest. That's good. That's uncommonly kind of you. Okay? Tells them to turn around. They do. And they're talking to a tree, essentially. Okay? Now, go back to the beginning of the novel, first chapter, where Sam is talking with Ted Sandyman and mentions his cousin Halfast had seen a walking tree in the North Moors and such. So, they continue talking, and the individual identifies himself as Treebeard, who we come to learn... Is also what? Fangorn. The forest is named after him or for him. Why? Because he's kind of, well, take that back. He's not kind of, yeah, kind of. The first int. I mean, he's. So, page 464. Um, he tells him, yes, I'm an int, or that's what they call me. Int is the word, the int. Notice, the int. I am, you might say in your manner of speaking. Fangor is my name according to some, Treebeard others. You know, you can call me int. So he starts going through the list of creatures, right? And he's like, there aren't any hobbits in this list. Where should I put you? Okay. So Pippin suggests a line, and they keep talking. Mary tells him his name, his whole name. Pippin tells him his whole name. Treebird's like, you know, you shouldn't do that. You should, you should protect your name. You should keep it kind of private and stuff. Top of 466. He asks them at the end of that second paragraph, and did you know Gandalf? Excuse me, they, Mary asks Pippin, did you know Gandalf? Listen to his reply. Yes, I do know him. Mary asks, past tense. Treebird replies, present tense. The only wizard that really cares about trees, said Treebird. Do you know him? Yes, said Pippin, we did. He was a great friend. He was our guide. So Treebird says, I'm not going to do anything with you. Not if you mean by that, do something to you because they asked, what are you going to do with us, right? Notice, Treebeard's kind of like Gandalf. He, he listens to words very carefully, and, and kind of like Erwin, and interprets them appropriately for the situation, okay? We could go back to the beginning of The Hobbit. I shouldn't go there because we don't have time. We could go back to the beginning of The Hobbit, and Gandalf shows up on Bilbo's doorstep, knocks on it, shows up, and, or, or they're sitting outside, Bilbo's having a pipe, Gandalf shows up, they start talking, and Bilbo says, you know, good morning. Like you would do to someone who you've just met, and it's morning, good morning. And they talk a little bit, and then Bilbo says again, good morning. And Big Gandalf says, why do you use that phrase, good morning, to mean many different things? Initially, you meant, you know, nice to meet you. Now it's, please leave. And Bilbo's like, no, 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 that's not what it means. It's exactly what he meant, okay? So, Treebeard. I'm not going to do anything to you without your leave. We might do some things together. I don't know about sides, because they've suggested, you know, what side are you on. I go my own way, but your way may go along with mine for a while. Now, does that sound like anybody else we've heard relatively recently? No. Well, kind of. post -Bormier. Aragorn. What does Elmer ask him? And he says, 
I serve no man. I hunt orcs wherever they may go. I don't care about your little borders. Okay? I go my own way, but your way, notice, may go along with mine for a while. So their way is kind of going like this, and his way is kind of going like this. And he says that our ways may coalesce for a bit, and then they might separate again. But you speak of Master Gandalf as if he was in a story that came to an end. Notice again the idea of story. Tolkien weaves it all throughout. Okay? Pippin, we do. He's fallen out of the story. Okay? So they keep talking. And He takes them to his home. He gives them food and drink. The int drink, which is going to have an effect on them later. And on 473, they start to talk about Saruman. Okay. Who is Saruman? asked Pippa. Do you know anything about his sister? He says he's a wizard. I don't I can't say anything else about that. I don't know the history of wizards. They appeared first after the great ships came over the sea. That's talking about when the elves came from Valinor back to Middle Earth in the book The Silmarillion. Okay? That was after the elves did some really bad stuff in Valinor, killed other elves, Kinsley. Okay? Galadriel was one of the elves who came back at that time, all right? Um, no, I take that back, because Galadriel did not come by a ship. She came over the ice bridges. Take that back. So, he gets down to the bottom of that page, 473. He's kind of like, you know, he's not like Gandalf. Saruman is. Don't really care for Saruman that much. I think that I now understand what he is up to. He is plotting to become a power. He has a mind of metal and wheels. He does not care for growing things except as far as they serve him for the moment. And now it is clear that he is a black traitor. He is taken up with foul folk with the orcs, blah, 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 blah. And what are they doing? They're cutting down his trees. Okay. So, they talk about the int wives, doesn't know where they are, they're missing, ints are slowly dying out because they haven't reproduced. Yes? Is it possible that the ent wives were at the same stuff as Gollum and Charlie? Could have been. Yep. Very well could have been. And he runs a bit of a, you know, poetry about the ent wives. And he says he's going to take them to an int moot. What's the word moot mean? Moot equals meaning. Okay. For what purpose? Louder? To decide what to do about sermon. Now he says the ints haven't had a moot. And they haven't done anything for a long time. Okay? They haven't, haven't had their hackles raised, so to speak. So, the moot goes on and on and on. And Mary and Pippin are left with Quick Bean. And the Ents decide they're going to march on Isengard. Page 485, we get the little song that they sing as they march. Uh, take that back. It wasn't Quick Beam. It was Bregalad. Quick Beam's another one who shows up. And they march to Isengard. And we see Isengard for the first time. You know, it's, it's like a, a valley shaped like a bowl, right? And at the center of that valley is a round ring of stone. Don't think like Stonehenge, because that's a ring of stones with a lot of open space in between the stones. This is a solid wall. Of stone, at the center of which is a tower. The tower is named Orthanc. 
All right? It's an old English word, and it means um, essentially like the beginning of thought. Okay? The tower was made by the men of Westerness, those guys who built the fortress that no longer stands on Weathertop. Right? So they looked down in, and Isengard used to be a beautiful valley full of trees, like orchards and such. Where I grew up, used to be called the Valley of Heart's Delight, Santa Clara Valley. Now it's called Silicon Valley. It is no one's Valley of Heart's Delight anymore. It's one of the most god-awful, ugly places on the face of this earth. Kind of like Peck Hall made large, you know, <laughs> if you want. So, we leave Mary and Pippin. Now notice what Tolkien has done. Two Towers begins with what happened? Literally, first couple pages. Boromir is dying, but he's not dead yet. Okay, so Sam and Frodo have gone off to Mordor, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't see them at the beginning of the Two Towers. They've left at the end of the Fellowship. So when we pick up, we see Aragorn, Legolas, Gimli, Boromir, right? Mm -hmm. We hear Merry and Pippin have been captured. So Merry and Pippin temporarily, they're with the orcs, okay? Then we get these three, four. Then what happens? This goes to Boromir, dead. And we have these three go on and chase after these two, okay? What's happening? Um, Fellowship of the Ring ends, what's the last chapter title? Breaking the Fellowship. It's not just broken, it's <laughs> think of the Fellowship as being shattered. Because what happened before that chapter? Gandalf died, right? Mm -hmm. That's the beginning of the breaking of the Fellowship. Okay? And what we see is, you know, think of you know, the Big Bang proverbially. And the pieces are, this piece is flying out here. These are flying out, and then this little piece goes away. These are flying out. So then they start to chase after them. And then what does Tolkien do? So we stay with Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli for a while. Now we come back to Merry and Pippin for just a chapter or two. Two, actually. Durakai and this one, right? Then what does Tolkien do? Meanwhile... He leaves us hanging there. So we have Mary and Pippin with all the ants looking down over Isengard. And you expect, you know, all hell to break loose. No. We go back to chapter 5, and we're back with Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli. Where? On the outskirts of Fangorn Forest, where the orc bodies are, you know, burning. Where, at this point, are Mary and Pippin? They're in the forest with Treebeard. Okay? We don't know exactly where. We don't know if, at this point, if they're on their way marching to Isengard, if Treebeard hasn't yet gotten to his home with them, or if they're at the Intmoot. Okay? So, what do they see in the forest? Before that, in the evening, an old man. they see an old man, and they kind of wonder, page 491. So they go under the edge, and, you know, Aragorn and, and Legolas kind of counsel Gimli, don't, don't go hacking any trees here. This is, this is good for us. And 491, about a third of the way down, Legolas says, it is old, very old, so old, that almost I feel young again, as I have not felt since I journeyed with you children. Now, Orlando Bloom looks to be about 19, 20 years old in the first, I think he was, in the first Lord of the Rings, or in the Two Towers film. Okay, um, How old is he? I've not looked at the pendency, so I can't tell you. But he's hundreds, if not thousands of years old. He's not nearly as old as Elrond or... Galadriel or, or any of them, okay? 
It is old and full of memory. I could have been happy here if I had come in days of peace. Gimli, I dare say you could. You are a wood elf anyway. In other words, you like treatment. See, not all elves are wood elves. Legolas is. Galadriel is. Elrond isn't. All right? And though elves of any kind are strange folk, yet you comfort me. Where you go, I will go. Anybody know where that phrase, where Tolkien plagiarizes that phrase from? Where? It is from the Bible. It's the book of Ruth. Okay. It's the book of Ruth. Um, Naomi and Ruth. Ruth's the daughter-in-law, I believe. Naomi is the mother-in-law. Ruth's husband dies and such. And she says to her mother-in-law, whither thou goest, I will go. In other words, where you go, I'm going to go with you. Okay? Well, what does this tell us that Gimli says this? That, that animosity that had been there? Where does that animosity disappear? With the interaction with that's it. That just all, all the boundaries between uh, Legolas and Gimli dissolves at that point. When, when Gimli says, the greatest thing ever, you know, about Galadriel, okay? Um, so they plunge into the forest of Fangorn. Let's see here. They see an old man. This is the next day kind of a thing. They keep going, and Legolas says, did you see that? What? There in the trees? I, I don't have it. What are you talking about? Show me. You know. Page four, 493. There. Okay. Gimli says, get your bow ready, Legolas. Legolas takes his bow, gets it ready. Gimli says, kill him. What's the matter with you? Why are you waiting? Aragorn says, Legolas is right. We may not shoot an old man so, at unawares and unchallenged, whatever fear or doubt be on us. In other words, we're not going to do any preemptive warfare here. We're, we're not going to strike before being struck. Okay? So the old man quickens his pace. He comes towards them. They couldn't see his face because he's hooded. And he speaks to them. 493. Third of the way down. Well, met indeed, my friends. I wish to speak to you. Will you come down? Because he's on a rocky hillside outcrop. Probably the same one Mary and Pippin met Treebeard on. Okay. I wish to speak to you. Will you come down or shall I come up? Without waiting for an answer, he begins to climb. Excuse me, they are. He's down below. Gimli says, stop him, Legless. Did I not say I wish to speak to you, said the old man. Put away that bow, Master Elf. And Legolas drops the bow. So, he speaks, something happens. Word of power, not a word of command, like late earlier, okay? And you, Master Gore, pray take away, take your hand from your axe half till I am up. You will not need such arguments. That is, those weapons aren't going to hurt me. Right. And so he gets up on their level. Hmm. Elf, man, dwarf. All dressed like elves. Interesting story here. Uh, you speak as one that knows Frangorn well. Is that so? Not well. That would be the study of many lives. In other words, nobody could know Frangorn well. Uh, what's your name? Hmm. What may you be doing, and what tale can you tell of yourselves? He says, as for my name, and he starts laughing. Now, you know, usually if someone just starts laughing, what do you think? Yeah, maniacal, you know. Have you not guessed it already? You have heard it before, I think. You've heard it before. Come, what of your tale? In other words, tell me, tell me, tell me. So he talks about hobbits. He talks about their errand. It's no longer as urgent as you thought. He turns away, and as he does, we're told. Immediately, right in the middle of 494, as if a spell had been removed, the others relaxed and stirred. 
Gimli's hand goes straight for his axe immediately. Aragorn draws his sword out. Notice, he doesn't just reach for the handle. He pulls it out. Legolas picks up his bow. And then they notice his gray cloak parts for a moment. And underneath they see white. Sarah man, cries Gimli. Speak, tell us where you've hidden, etc. The old man was too quick for him. He sprang to his feet, leaped to the top of a large rock. There he stood, grown suddenly tall, towering above them. His hood and his gray rags were flung away, his white garment shone. He lifted up his staff, Gimli's axe leaped from his grasp, fell ringing on the ground. The sword of Aragorn stiffened his motionless hand, blazed with sudden fire. And I think that means probably literally the blade turned to flame. Okay. Legolas gave a great shout, shot an arrow high into the air, and cried. What is the great shout? I think it's what he cries. Mithrandir, Mithrandir. The elvish name for Gandalf. Well meant, I say to you again. In other words, yes, I am Gandalf. Aragorn, beyond all hope, you return to us in our need. What veil is over my sight? Why beyond all hope? Was he dead? Yes, he was. He was dead dead. I'm going to give you, yeah, I shouldn't do that. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Um, he says, yes, I was Gandalf. And he comes down, and he looks at Gimli, and he puts his hand on Gimli's head. And the dwarf looked up and laughed. He says, but you're all in white. Now, when he puts his hand on Gim Gimli's head, it's just kind of like, you know, there, good boy. I don't think so. I think it's almost an act of blessing. Okay? Almost. I'm not saying it is. But you're all in white. Notice, if it had been Sarah Man, would he have been all in white? And what did he change his white robe into? A coat of many colors. Remember, Gandalf said, I looked at it and I saw it wasn't white. It kind of shimmered, all different colors, okay? Yes, notice, I am white now. What did Gimli say? You're all in white. Gandalf says, I am white. Notice the distinction? One has a preposition, the other one doesn't. He's not saying, yes, I, I, I am in white now. I look better in white, don't you think? He's saying he is whiteness. Indeed, I am Sarah Man, might almost, one might almost say. Sarah Man as he should have been. But come, tell me about yourselves. He says, I've passed through fire and deep water since we parted. I've forgotten much that I thought I knew, learned my, again much that I had forgotten. I can see many things far off, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So, Aragorn, what do you want to know? <laughs> uh, did you find the hobbits? He says, nope, haven't found them. Yes, they are safe. Legolas mentions an eagle that he's seen. He says, yep, that was why here the wind lord. Okay. They keep talking. 496, just past the middle of the page. Now nah, take that back, middle of the page. Aragorn says to Gandalf, you have not said all that you know or guess. Uh, Gandalf says to Aragorn, you have not said all that you know or guess, Aragorn, my friend. Poor Boromir. I could not see what happened to him. It was a sore trial for such a man, a warrior, and a lord of men. Notice he's not saying it would be that kind of trial for any man. A warrior and a lord of men. Why was it um, a sore trial for that kind of person? What did Gandalf say when Frodo offered him the ring? 
he will have great need of it. He says, do not tempt me. Boromir had great need of it, but wasn't strong enough to turn away the temptation. Galadriel told me that he was in peril, but he escaped in the end. How? Frodo, forgive me. I don't know what came over me. That's how. He escaped in the end implies what? He found his cure. Just like he hopes Gollum will. I am glad. It was not in vain that the young hobbits came with us. Why? His cure has to do with what? His redemption came as a result of trying to rescue Mary and Pippin. If Mary and Pippin hadn't been there, the implication is he wouldn't have found that. He wouldn't have been cured. Right? But that is not the only part they have to play. Right? I mean, he's going to give us some... He's not going to spell it out. Right? But it's going to be clear. Pippin's being there. It should be clear already. Pippin's being there and not having been sent back home is responsible for what happened. Keep going. Gandalf's what? And then coming back is Gandalf's what? Gandalf's catastrophe. Remember the fairy story essay, Tolkien defines catastrophe. A sudden and miraculous grace never to be counted on to recur. Well, this is a grace. This is a hope beyond all hope, Aragorn calls it. Okay? What about Mary? Well, we have to wait for that one. They were brought to Fangor, and their coming was like the falling of small stones that starts an avalanche in the mountains. Even as we talk here, I hear the first rumblings. What, what is he talking about? Notice Aragorn's like, quit speaking of damn riddles. Just speak clearly. Okay. What's the avalanche? What's the, you know, the small pebble moving that begins the avalanche? They're meeting Treebeard. That's the, that's the beginning of it. Okay. Riddles? He says, no, I was just talking loud to myself, you know. Habit of the old. They choose the wisest person present to speak to. Long explanations needed by the young or weary. And everyone's like, what are you calling young? <laughs> Compared to Gandalf, though? It's like a newborn. Okay, so what shall I tell you? Enemy has long known the ring is abroad. It's born by a hobbit. He knows the number of our company, blah, 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 blah. Okay? He's got his messengers out. They failed again. They haven't found the ring. They haven't brought away the, host the hobbits as hostages. In other words, he knew that hobbits were captured. He doesn't have them. Ergo, he's really angry. <laughs> okay. Gimli, then Saruman, then is not Saruman a traitor? He goes, oh yeah, he is. And is not that strange? Nothing we've endured of late has seemed so grievous as the treason of Isengard. What, what does he mean, the treason of Isengard? It's not necessarily the treason of Saruman against them. <laughs> it's the treason of Saruman against his master. Sauron. Okay. So, 498.99, bottom of 498, Gimli asked, did we see you in Fangorn the other night? He said, no, it wasn't me. So it was a terrible man. Okay. 499. They finally ask. Legolas does. Where are the hobbits? With Treebeard and the Ents. Gandalf. Now, look who questions the veracity of that statement and why. The Ents? 
Then there is truth in the old legends about the dwellers in the deep forests and the giant shepherds of the trees. Wait, you mean those old legends, those old wife tales are true? What did he say to the writer of Rowan? When the writer said, do we walk in legends around the green earth? He said, you could do both. Are there still ints in the world? I thought they were only a memory of ancient days. If indeed they were ever more than a legend of Rowan. He implies we never knew about that legend up in the north and that the people of Gondor didn't. He implies. He doesn't state that. Okay? Legless. Legend? Okay. Shut up. Every elf in Wilderland has sung songs of the old on a dream and their long sorrow. If I were to meet one still walking in this world, then indeed I should feel young again. So imagine how young he's going to feel when he meets the int. The first int. Okay. Who is this tree beard? It says Legolas. Because notice, not even Legolas knows. He is Fangorn, the guardian of the forest. He is the oldest of the ants, the oldest. Now, notice this, because this might be an error. Well, let me rephrase that. This might be in contradiction to something said earlier by a different character. This might, you know, and that contradiction might be one of those problems that Tolkien referred to in the forward. That, you know, I know what one of the errors, but I'm just going to leave it. Okay? He is the oldest of the ants, the oldest living thing that still walks beneath the sun upon this middle earth. What's the contradiction? Tom Bombadil. He said, I was the oldest. He was here. Before the dark came from outside. Okay? Treebeard wasn't there then. Because nothing else living was there at that point. Right? How do you possibly solve the contradiction? I mean, if Tom Bombadil wasn't necessarily in the form of Tom Bombadil, then he wouldn't count. Notice what he says. The oldest living Thing. Maybe Tom Bombadil lives in a way that we're, that, that to use the phrase life and living doesn't mean. Okay? It still walks beneath the sun upon this middle earth. And maybe Tom Bombadil doesn't exist, quote unquote, beneath the sun. Okay? I'm just throwing that up. So, they keep talking, and Gimli says, um, Gandalf mentions, Treebeard was here two days ago. It's where he met the hobbits. Okay. Um, he didn't speak uh, my name, etc. Gimli, perhaps he thought you were Saruman. I, but you speak of him as if he was a friend. I thought Fangorn. And when Gimli says Fangorn there, he means the forest. I thought Fangorn was dangerous, Gandalf. Dangerous, and so am I. Very dangerous. More dangerous than anything you will ever meet, unless you get taken to sour. Gandalf's kind of implying there, I'm no longer worried about meeting a Balrog. All right? And Aragorn is dangerous, and Legolas is dangerous. And Gimli, you are dangerous in your own fashion. And maybe another word to use is the one he uses in a moment about Fangorn. Perilous. All right. So, what are the ants going to do, Legolas asks. And uh, I don't know. <laughs> I do not think they know themselves. I wonder. Okay. So they ask. Well, before they ask Gandalf what happened, um, Aragorn says, are we going to go see our friends? Are we going to go meet up with Treebeard? He says, no, we have, we have to do something else first. Middle of 500. He said, that is not the road you must take. I have spoken words of hope, but only of hope. Hope is not victory. Okay, now, now notice that. This is, I think, Tolkien, the survivor of World War I, speaking. Hope 
isn't a tactic. Hope isn't a strategy. Hope is merely hope. What must be done? That hope must be actualized. It's got to be put into some kind of action. War is upon us and all our friends, a war in which only the use of the ring could give us surety of victory. It fills me with great sorrow and great fear, for much shall be destroyed and all may be lost. He says, I am Gandalf, Gandalf the White, but black is mightier still. Okay? He says, the ring is beyond our reach, off into deadly peril, blah, blah, blah. And then he tells Aragorn, do not regret your choice in the valley of the Emin Mule, nor call it a vain pursuit. Now, what have we been told earlier about Gandalf, even before he became Gandalf the White? What can he do? What power does he have? He can read minds. At least partially. Notice, he knows what Aragorn was thinking. Nor call it a vain pursuit. You chose him, it doubts the path that seemed right. The choice was just. It has been rewarded. We have met in time who otherwise might have met too late. He says, no, you have to go to theater. You've got to go to the Golden Hall, okay? Legolas. Legolas takes that to me, then we're not going to see Mary Pippin again. Gandalf says, I didn't say that. I just said you've got to go see theater. Aragorn, yeah, it's a long walk. He says, don't worry about it. We'll have horses, okay? Page 501. And Aragorn says, yes, we'll set out together, but I do not doubt you will come there before me. He rises, he looks long at Gandalf, the other gazes at them in silence as they stood there facing one another. So you have Merry and Pippin looking at Gandalf and Aragorn who are staring at each other. We're going to have to see a very similar scene, probably not today, but possibly because I'm going to skip a lot, where Pippin is going to look at Gandalf and Denethor staring at each other. And he's going to see them in something like other vision. And then later on, towards the end of the third volume, Sam is going to look at Frodo and Gollum staring at each other. And he's going to see them with kind of an other vision. So notice this. The great figure of the man, Aragorn, son of Arthur, a tall, stern of stone, hand upon the hilt of his sword, he looked as if some king out of the midst of the sea had stepped upon the shores of lesser men. Before him stooped the old figure, white shining now as if with some light kindled within, bent, laden with years, but holding a power beyond the strength of kings. So Aragorn has one kind of power, and Gandalf has some other kind of power. And notice Gandalf is radiating what? There's light coming from within. It's not like, all right, cue the spotlight. Do I not say truly, Gandalf, that you could go whithersoever you wish quicker than I? And this I also say. You are our captain and our banner. The Dark Lord has nine, but we have one mightier than they. Okay? You are mightier than the nine put together, Aragorn is suggesting. Right? Legolas says, yes, we'll follow you. But you got to tell us what happened. We, we got to know, okay? So he says, I fell, I fell, and I fell, and I fell, and I fell. And Durin's, uh, Gimli's like, oh yeah, the, the chasm there of Casa Doom, that's really deep. I mean, the dwarves know about it and such. He says, I fell and fell and fell and fell and fell, and we hit water, and then we found the winding stair. Page 502. The endless stair, sorry. Gimli, oh, that's been lost for ages. Gandalf, not destroyed. So, we came out of the water, we got on the stair, and we started running up, you know, chasing each other. From the lowest dungeon to the highest peak, it climbed, ascending an unbroken spiral, blah, 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 blah. Okay? And he says, there upon Kelabdil, the top of the mountain, there is a lonely window in the snow. Before it lay a narrow space, a dizzy area above the mists of the world. The sun shone fiercely there, all below wrapped in cloud. The Balrog springs out, comes out through this doorway. And I don't think it means like a literal door. It's just an opening to a cave. Okay. And what happens? Boom! He bursts into flame. 
none to see, etc. He said, but what would they say if they saw what happened? Those that looked up from afar thought that the mountain was crowned with storm. Now, who are those that looked up from afar? Can we take any wild guesses? I think we can. Galadriel. Because as soon as they tell her that Gandalf fell at the Bridge of Khazad Doom and stuff, it's kind of implied she's thinking, hmm. Okay. Thunder they heard and lightning smote upon Calabdil, leaped back, broken into tongues of fire. Is not that enough? A great smoke rose about us, vapor and steam, ice fell like rain. I threw down my enemy, and he fell from the high place and broke the mountainside where he smote it in his ruin. And that's kind of a paraphrase, and I can never remember which, and I don't have it written in my book. Uh, the passage in either Ezekiel or Daniel, where Satan is cast out of heaven and hits the earth, and a big pit is dug. It's where Dante gets the idea for his depiction of hell. Okay? If you're familiar with Dante and the Divine Comedy, the Inferno is shaped like this. It's a big pit. Why? Because it's the pit that is made. It's the crater that is made when Satan hits the earth when he's cast out of hell. Okay? Uh, cast out of heaven. So, then darkness took me, and I strayed out of thought and time. And I wandered far on roads that I will not tell. What does he mean, straight out of thought and time? He didn't exist in this world anymore. He, he was on another plane. He needed another phrase, another word for that. He died. I heard, heard today, coming into work, I was listening to Classic FM, it's a British uh, radio station, you can listen online. And they were talking about um, the coffin for Queen Elizabeth. Um, and how, how did the newscaster put it? Something like, Her Majesty will be taken. And I thought, well, no. Because Her Majesty is no longer with us. Her Majesty is dead. Dead, dead, dead. Now they have what? His Majesty. Now there's King Charles III. The moment... Queen Elizabeth died, you can no longer refer to what held her as Queen Elizabeth. That was Queen Elizabeth, but it ain't anymore. Okay? When he says, I strayed out of thought and time, out of time means time no longer contains him. Well, what exists in time? Life, living, okay? And I wandered far on roads I will not tell. We don't know what those roads are, but he says, naked I was sent back for a brief time until my task is done. What does he mean by naked? Does he mean physically without any clothing? I mean, that's possible meaning. That would probably be the most literal meaning. What else can it mean, though? New. New? Disembodied? That is, mind, soul, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, but not embodied, incarnated. So, naked I was sent back. Notice what that implies. If he was sent, Somebody sent him. there was a sender, you know. You receive a package that's not yours. What do you write on it? Return to sender. Okay. For a brief time until my task is done. In other words, you're not done yet. Finish the job. Then you can come back. And naked I lay upon the mountaintop. See, I think that is the literal without clothing. So, naked he was sent back and embodied when he was put on the mountaintop. And he says, 
And I lay there, the crowd, the tower behind me crumbled into dust. So no one's going to run up the endless stair again and burst out onto the top of the mountain because what had been at the top of the mountain has now imploded. I was alone, forgotten, without escape upon the hard horn of the world. There I lay staring upward while the stars wheeled days past. Okay? Then told Gwai here the wind lord came. How did Gwai here the wind lord know to come look for him? Because Galadriel sent a message. And I think the message is kind of, he can't be dead. He can't really be dead. Or, even if he was dead, he needs to come back. I don't know. She has a secret telegraph to send to Valinor, you know, or something. So, he says, oh, that reminds me. I've got words for you guys. Forgot. Let's see. Um... He says, Aragorn, here's what is told to remind you, 503. Where now are the Dunedain, LSR, LSR, where I do the kinsfolk wander afar, near, nears the time, blah, blah, blah. and she mentions the gray company ride from the north. Okay? Dark is the path appointed for thee. And he knows immediately what, what's being talked about, the paths of the dead. Right? So Aragorn gets word from Gladys. Legolas, beware the sound of the sea. Why? Because in Tolkien's world, if an elf hears the sound of the ocean surf, the elf will no longer feel at home in Middle Earth. That elf, once he hears the sound of the ocean, will forever be drawn to the sea to go over and to go back to Valinor. Gimli, what about me? She sent me no message? Legolas, Gimli, be glad. Dark are her words. That's no comfort. What then? Would you ever speak openly of your death? He says, yes. <laughs> Just to hear words from her mouth, you know. Gandalf, hey, why? He says, Gimli, yes. Give his ladies greeting. Lock bearer. Wherever thou goest, my thought goes with thee. But have a care to lay thine axe to the right tree. What does that mean? Wherever thou goest, my thought goes with thee. I'm thinking of you, Gimli. And he just said to go, oh, you know. Why else? What's he carrying? Three strands of her hair connected to the head. Okay. It's like within those three strands are her thoughts. And what does Gimli do? In happy hour you have returned to a Gandalf capering as he sang, sang loudly in the strange dwarf tongue. Didn't get it because I wasn't feeling well, but the Highland, Middle Tennessee Highland games were held in Henderson, Hendersonville last weekend. And you can see all kinds of capering, capering and Scottish dancing and such. He dances a jig, essentially, when he says these words. He is so overcome with joy. Okay. So, they go to the king of the Golden Hall. We're going to skip quickly. Page 508, we get a little passage, a little poem, that's based on an old English poem called The Wanderer. And in that old English poem, you have a passage called the Ubisunt motif. Ubisunt is Latin for where are. Um, a folk group in the late 60s, mid 60s, did a song, I can't remember if it was Peter, Paul, and Mary, I think it was, called Where Have All the Flowers Gone? And the, the verse is something like, where have all the flowers gone? A long time passing. And it refers to young men dying in Vietnam. Okay? So you get this passage, where now the horse and the rider? Where is the horse that was blowing? Where is the home and the halberd? And one of the things I actually, actually think Peter Jackson did really, really well is in the extended version of this, I think it's the extended, we hear Aragorn chant this 
in the language of Rohan, and it's Old English. It's Anglo-Saxon, because the Rohirrim are based on Anglo-Saxons. Okay? It's, and it's beautifully done. They're going around a burial mound, and the Aragorn sings this little passage. Okay? So they go to the Golden Hall, 511, and the door warden tells them, you got to leave all your weapons outside. Old English, this is Anglo-Saxon custom. You don't want you know, visitors coming into your hall armed to the hilt because bad things happen. The Old English poem Beowulf discusses this. Beowulf says before he dies, you know, I never drunkenly slew my hearth companions. He, he raises that as an item, you know, that he should be proud of. The implication is, you know, these guys are throwing back tankards of beer and ale and they get angry at each other and start comparing the lengths of their swords. And they end up killing each other. Okay. So. Gimli leaves his axe. Legolas leaves his bow. Aragorn's like, I don't want to leave Anduro. I mean, this was the sword of Elendil. Mm, really? But he will. And the guy says, Gandalf, you have to leave your staff. He's like, hey, I'm an old man. I need my stick. Go away. Mm -hmm. And he says, I'm not going here. You know, Thaden can come out to me. So he takes his staff in. They go inside. Page 512. Gandalf addresses Thaden. Hail Thad and son of Thingol, uh, 512, bottom of the page. I have returned, for behold, the storm comes, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And the old man rises to his feet, leans heavily on a short black staff with a handle of white bone. And he calls Gandalf, you know, Master Stormcrow, etc., etc., meaning the bringer of bad news. 513, we hear Worm Tongue speak. Okay. And Gandalf addresses him. In the warm tongue, speaking some more at the very bottom of the page. Gandalf says, The courtesy of your hall is somewhat lessened of late, Theoden, son of Thingol. Has not the messenger from your gate reported the names of my companions? That is, do you not know who these people are? Aragorn, son of Arathorn, descended by a long line from blah, blah, blah. And Wormtongue speaks again. Oh, so you did come through the Golden Wood, and you have, you know, the sorcerer's nets on you, etc. 514, middle of the page. Gandalf, you know, sings a passage about Galadriel. And then he throws his cloak aside, stands up straight, doesn't lean, lean on his staff and says, The wise speak only of what they know, Grima, son of Galmod. A witless worm have you become. Therefore be silent. Keep your forked tongue behind your teeth. I have not passed through fire and death, makes it clear now, to bandy crooked words with a serving man till the lightning falls. He raises his staff, and what happens? Roll of thunder. Sunlight's blotted out from the eastern windows. So when the sunlight's blotted out, what happens within this hall? It's pitch black, except for the fire burning on the hearth in the center of the hall. See, it's an Anglo-Saxon hall. It's made out of wood, and the fire is right in the middle of the hall. There's not a fireplace with a chimney. The smoke just rises, and there's a hole through the roof that the smoke goes out through, all right? And we hear Worm John, told you to take away the damn staff, you know. And so what does Gandalf do? He addresses Theoden. He says, will you hearken to me? Do you ask for help? And he lifts his staff and he points to a window. And from that one window, the darkness disappears and light comes through. Not all is dark. Okay, but how much is? From one window. And I think, you know, visually, we're meant to think that this is like a postage stamp. 
The implication is this is a big hall made out of wood, and there's a little patch of light. The rest of the room is dark. Okay? So, not all is dark. Take courage. For better help you will not find. No counsel have I given to those that despair. Why not? Despair is only for those who have seen the end beyond all doubt. That's what he says earlier. But why else? Despair literally means what? No hope. If you have no hope, and he's saying, any words of counsel I would give you mean what? You know, September is National Suicide Prevention Month. Okay? Someone who has decided, I mean fully decided, to commit suicide, can you talk that person out of it? Not really. Not really. You cannot provide that hope. Where's it got to come from? <laughs> it's got to come from within. You can save those who are really, really, really close. Right? And I usually tell a story here about Jordan Peterson doing a talk, but we don't have time. Um, I'll, maybe I'll post it. So he says, Yet counsel I could give and words I could speak to you. I could give you hope. Will you hear them? They are not for all ears. <laughs> Word of time. Not literally, just. I bid you come out before your doors and look abroad. Too long have you sat in shadows and trusted to twisted tales and crooked, pro crooked promptings. So Theoden gets up out of his chair. Why does Gandalf say, come outside? Because it's light out there. Keep going. Fresh air is nice for you. He's probably been sitting in the same chair for a real long time. Yeah. He needs those four things fairy tales provide. Fantasy escape recovery and you catastrophe slash happy ending. He can't get him where he is. Why? He shut himself off from even the possibility of that. He shut himself off from the possibility of seeing anything strange or arresting. He shut himself off from the possibility of there being any hope escape or from seeing things differently. Okay? So he gets up. And notice, a faint light grew in the hall again. Are we told, he gets up and Gandalf says, you know, turn up the, turn up the dimmers. <laughs> Bring the light up slowly. As he rises, increase the light. No. Why does it get lighter in the hall? The hall is metaphorical for what? I mean, it's a literal hall. But the atmosphere in the hall is also a metaphor for what? Theoden's mind, his heart, they're darkened. When he rises up, that indicates. Keep going. Um, just... He has hope. He's, he's not totally darkened in his mind. So when he gets up, that little flicker, I'm going to use a word that's used in the Harry Potter novels, that our door. A or in his heart, that little flame starts to get blown and it increases slightly. Alright? Uh, faint light grows in the hall. The woman ru he runs to the king's side. She takes his arm. She helps him down from the dais. They go through the hall. Worm tongue is lying on the floor. They go to the doors. Gandalf, you know. Knox says, open the doors. And Gandalf tells the lady, Lady Awen, leave him alone. Okay, This is for his ears, not for yours. She goes, and we're told, middle of 515. She sees Aragorn, and he sees her for the first time. Okay. Very fair was her face. Her long hair was like a river of gold, slender and tall. She was in her white robe. Blah, blah, blah. Aragorn, for the first time in the full light of day, beheld Eowyn, Lady Rowan, thought her fair, fair and cold, like morning, a pale spring that has not yet come into womanhood. And she was suddenly aware of him. Okay. 
So Gandalf says to Theoden, look upon your land. Breathe the free air again. And look at this description. It's one of the most powerful and important little descriptive scenes Tolkien gives us in the entire novel. From the porch upon the top of the high terrace, they could see beyond the stream, the green fields of Rowan fading into distant gray. Curtains of wind-blown rain were slanting down. So looking off in the distance, there's a storm, and they can see the rain blowing okay, at a slant. The sky above and to the west was still dark with thunder. It's thundering. Lightning far away flickered among the tops of hidden hills. But the wind had shifted to the north, and already the storm that had come out of the east was receding. Okay. Rolling away southward to the sea. So the storm had come from the east. Metaphor? Yeah, probably. I mean, it's literally true. It's metaphorical because what's east? Mordor, Sauron, evil. So the storm blows through, but now it is receding to the south. It's dissipating. It's lost all of its power. And we get this. Suddenly through a rent in the clouds behind them. So they're standing on the porch. Back here is the hall. Way behind, in the clouds, there's a break. And a shaft of sunlight shines through. A shaft of sun stabbed down. The falling showers that they see now kind of off in the distance, and I think even around them, do what? Gleam like silver. What has just happened? Notice, what did the showers look like before? Gray. And now, what had been gray is like falling diamonds, falling silver. And far away, the river glittered like a shimmering glass. And what does Theoden say? It is not so dark here. Here, where? <laughs> Here, out there, yes. Here, where else? He's just experienced recovery. Only he's experienced literal recovery. He is seeing as he was meant to see. How so? How did he see prior to Gandalf's coming? Louder? Darkness. Everything was dark. Why? Grave a worm tongue, telling him everything's dark. You cannot win. Win. You are going to die. Rohan, Rohan will fall. Gondor will fall. Rip everything will fall. There is no victory. Grima is speaking the words of nihilism. Grima is speaking the words that every suicide hears in his or her brain. There is no light at the end of the tunnel. There is only a tunnel of growing and growing and growing darkness. In it now. Okay. Take two children. You'll hear me probably do this again when we get to Harry Potter novels. Take two children from birth. Okay. Put one in a house, family, where the ch child is told from the beginning of life. You're a lousy piece of crap, and you will never amount to anything. And let the child hear that for the every day for the first 12 years of its life. Take the other child, put him in a house where the family says, you are loved, and you can achieve anything. And let the child hear that for the first 12 years every day of its life. What are you going to have at 12 years? This one probably will be a little bit more successful. I'm hedging. This one, the one that hears you're a piece of crap and you will never amount to anything, is probably going to become on the foul side of the law. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Why? Because there's no reinforcement. There's nothing to build up what's inside. This one gets everything. It's why, you know, children raised with books in the house versus one raised without. You look at all the studies, 
These become achievers, these don't. Okay? So, Gandalf says, no, you're right, it's not so dark. Nor does age lie so heavily on your shoulders as some would have you think. Throw away your prop. How old is Theoden? Forties. Late forties, early fifties. I'm older than Theoden. Okay? You don't need that stick. Throw it away. And he drops it, and he drew himself up slowly as a man that is stiff from long bending over some dull toil. What's the dull toil that he bent over? It's all those thoughts in his mind that told him, you're an old man. Now tall and straight he stood, his eyes were blue as he looked into the opening sky. Dark have been my dreams of late, but I feel as one new awakened. There's the leap. There's the recovery. Okay. I would now, would their means wished, desired, that you would come before Gandalf. Well, he did come before. Right? When he was given shadow facts, he just wouldn't listen. For I fear that already you have come too late. And what starts to happen right there? He starts to slip back. Exactly. He starts to slip back into that old mindset. Okay. So Gandalf gets him to release Eomer because he's falsely imprisoned. And they give Thad and his sword back. And it's like, you know, he holds on to the sword and the muscles just start to grow again. They fill out what had been atrophied. Not literally, kind of metaphorically. So he gets ready to ride. Worm tongue's given a choice. What choice is that? You can either come with us or you can go where you want. You can come with us and prove your service to your Lord, or you can go wherever you want. You can even go back to Saruman if you want. All right? And we find out what kind of person Worm tongue really is. And he goes after Saruman. Okay? So, chapter 7, we're going to say hardly anything about it. Helm's Deep. Helm's Deep, the entire chapter, is only 16 pages. The actual battle in the chapter is only 9 pages. If you watch the film, The Two Towers... It is fully a fourth of the entire film. Why? Because it's a massive battle sequence and it's really cool to look at. It's a massive battle sequence and they could spend, you know, tens of millions of dollars on CGI effects because you could have 10,000, you know, orcs and elves and, and they're all, you know. Why else? When, when this film came out, I was invited to do a... Um, couple of different conferences, spoke at one at Oxford and one in Pennsylvania. And one of the things, you know, that was asked of those of us on, that were panelists was, does Tolkien glorify war? Because a lot of people thought, oh, here's this guy, he's just glorifying war. You know? And he doesn't. It's the exact opposite. Tolkien abhors war. Why? Because he experienced it. Because all but one of his best friends, by the time he was 26, were dead because of war. Peter Jackson never got that. He, he didn't get the memo. He didn't understand. Because he viewed, he and his wife, because they were his screenwriters, they viewed The Lord of the Rings as what kind of genre? Louder? Action. Keep going. Definitely action. What else? Adventure. What kind of adventure? S and S, sword and sorcery. It was Dungeons and Dragons writ large. No, hell no. Throw all kinds of obscenities in front of that hell no. Totally, totally wrong. The swords and the sorcery are in a sense irrelevant to the story. Okay. 
So, oh, and what else wonderful thing do we get in the Helm's Deep passage of the film? We have to introduce some humor because this film is too dark. So let's throw in, throw in dwarf tossing, which dwarves, our dwarfs, in our world, really did not appreciate that. With, you know, good reason. Okay, so they, they make their way to Isengard. They get saved. They come out of Helm's Deep alive. They don't die, you know. Gandalf helps, and others help. And they, as they make their way to Isengard, we see what happens to the piles of dead orcs. The Hjorns, moving trees, come through, and they're kind of like... Uh, what do you want to call them? Nature's refuse removal team, something like that. Hazmat team. Like a like a, a group of army ants going through and kind of eating up everything. Yeah. You know, and Legolas kind of wants to go check them out. Daniel's like, no, 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 no. You don't want to go in those trees. Okay. Um, Five forty nine. That's what they're talking about. Let's see here. Bottom of 549.50, Theoden is talking about stories and legends he's heard about the orc, about the ants and such. And he says, you know, top of 550, I don't usually talk about this, but four lines down. And that we call the life of men the way of the world. That is, tending our beast fields, built our houses, wrought our tools, ridden away to help in the wars of ministry. We call that life. We cared little for what lay beyond the borders of our land. Songs we have that tell of these things, but we are forgetting them, teaching them only to children as a careless custom. Gets the fairy story essay. What does he mean, borders of our land? He means literally the borders of our land. We don't pay anything about what's going on beyond there. But he's talking about the land up here too. There are things beyond the borders, things that we don't think of. And he's saying, you know, we ought to start paying a little bit more attention. Okay. So they make their way to Isengard. And what do they see when they get there? The ring of stone on the outside has been destroyed. The tower is still there. And the, the bowl part that's inside there's now water everywhere because the ants diverted the Eisen River to clean it out, okay? And to flood all the tunnels and pits that Sarah Man had made. Well, what else do they see? They see smoke rising from one of the slabs of stone. And then they realize, oh, there's two people there. And it's Mary Pippin doing what? I'm just having, a big having a beer and cigar, you know, beer and pipe. Yeah, okay. So, Mary and Pippin tell Gandalf they had an et al. Treebeard's off over there. You know, you can go find him. Chapter 9, Flotsam and Jetsam, where we get some exposition, some background information. We find out what happened with Mary and Pippin when they were captured by the orcs, what they did. We find out what happened with the Entmoot, okay, and... When they arrived at Isengard, chapter 10, uh, Voice of Saruman, page 577. Aragorn, uh, Aragorn. Gandalf says, I'm going to go talk to Saruman. Okay. And he says, some of you can come with me. This is uh, bottom of 576, he says that. And Gimli says, I want to go too. I want to talk to him. I wish to see him and learn if he really does look like you. Gandalf, and how will you know that? If he wants to look like me, he will look like me in your eyes. Okay? Pippin says, ah, oh, what's the danger then? Will he shoot at us or pour fire out of the window? Or can he put a spell on us? Gandalf says, well, last is most likely. If you ride to his door with a light 
heart. Don't be a damn fool, Pippin. Mm -hmm. Okay, beware of his voice. So they come down to the foot. So Orthanc is you know, shaped kind of like this, and there's a stairway that winds up it. And you get to one point, and there's you know a little platform, and up here there's another little platform, and there's a door that goes in here, right? So Gandalf says, I'm going up, because I've been in Orthanc, I know my peril. Alright? King says, I'm going up too. Why? I'm old. And I don't fear dying. That's what he says. I fear no peril anymore. Gandalf, as you want, Aragorn's going to come also. Notice, he doesn't offer the choice to Aragorn. Why not? He knows he's coming. And he has to come. Aragorn's whole future is bound up with this place, partially at least. Okay? Let the others wait. That is Legolas, Gimli, the Hobbits, all the writers. You guys stay down below. Gimli, no, we're coming. We alone here represent our kindred. Ah, that's a good reason. Pippin and Mary, why don't they get to go up and represent their kindred? Okay. Notice they don't. <laughs> it's like a little bit of wisdom enters their minds. Well, no, let's stay down here. Okay. So they go up, worm tongue comes out, Gandalf says, go get Sarah Man. 578. Ceremony comes out. We get a description of his voice. And then we hear him say, Why must you disturb my rest? Will you give me no peace at all by night or day? Its tone was that of a kindly heart, aggrieved by injuries. They look up and they see a tall figure standing, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Gimli says, Like and yet unlike. But come now, two at least of you I know by name. And he addresses Gandalf, and then he addresses Theoden. And how does he address Theoden? What kind of language does he use? Flowery. He, he praises him. He flatters him. Of the house of Eor, a worthy son of Thingol, the thrice renowned, blah, blah, blah. Why haven't you come as a friend? And he says, I alone can help you. Theoden opens his mouth like he's going to speak. He's going to reply. He looks up, but he doesn't say anything. We get a lit, long paragraph. But then Gimli speaks. 579, middle page. The words of this wizard stand on their heads. In the language of Orthanc, help me true, and saving means slain. That is plain. In other words, Gandalf, uh, Gandalf, it's almost like Tolkien has read his George Orwell by the time he writes this. I'm not saying he has. I have no idea if Tolkien wrote read Orwell. What do I mean? Gimli sees through Saruman and says, that's doublespeak. War is slavery. Uh, war is peace. Freedom is slavery. You know, a couple of the mottos from 1984. Peace! And for a fleeting moment, his voice was less suave and a light flickered in his eyes. I notice about Saruman. He knows who this is. I do not speak to you yet, Gimli glowing son, far away as your home. And I'm sure you've done wondrous you know, things in battle. But allow me to speak with my neighbor first. Second time, he addresses Theoden. He makes an offer to him. Okay? Still, Theoden did not answer. Whether he strove with anger or doubt, none could say. And notice, the narrator doesn't tell us. Doesn't jump inside, you know, Theoden's mind and say, ooh, he really wanted to leave. And now Eomer speaks. Now we feel the, feel the peril we are warned of. Have we ridden forth to victory, only to stand at last amazed by an old liar with honey on his forked tongue? What does Amir really get to? It's the end of his little speech. Remember Theodred at the forest and the grave of Hama in Helm's Deep. Who's Theodred? Theoden's son. Theoden's son. What happened to him? At the forge, he was hacked into pieces after he had died. See, there's this unwritten law 
in warfare. And it goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years. When an enemy dies, you leave the body alone. The body is sacrosanct. It's sacred. You, you don't touch it. That's why, in fact, the idea is thousands of years old. That's why in the Iliad, when Achilles kills Hector and then drags his body around the circle until body parts start to fall off, the gods are really angry. The Trojans are really angry. Okay. Why? You take the body and you bury it. Because without burial, there can be no peace for the soul. So, remember your son, hacked to death, and Hama, his door warden, right? If we speak of poison tongues, what shall we say of yours, young serpent? And notice, Sarah man loses his cool. He's, he's no longer totally mastering himself. And then he catches himself. And what does he say? Yours is not diplomacy anywhere. You are what? You are merely a weapon in your Lord's hand. You're the gun. You're not the finger pulling the trigger. <laughs> You're not meant for great counsels and such. Maybe one day you will be. So what does he do? He then addresses Theoden third time. Am I to be called a murderer because valiant men have fallen in battle? Is that what Aylmer said? What has he just done? He's used the idea of moral equivalency. Oh, you died in war. Therefore, that makes the person who killed you a murderer. Nope. When soldiers kill each other in battle, that is not murder. If, however, you go and kill someone who is protecting women and children away from the battlefield, that is murder. That's what happened to Theodore. If you go to war needlessly, for I do not desire it, then men will be slain. It's kind of you saying, suggesting you started this war. Shall we have peace and friendship, you and I? It is ours to command. And Theoden says, we will have peace. And several of the writers, yes, we can go back home. And what does Theoden say? We'll have peace when? When you are hanging from the gibbet, from a gallows, only when you're dead will we have peace. Mm -hmm. And the writers gaze up and they're like, oh my God, he's just sitting close to death. And then what does Sarah man do? Oh, he totally loses it. I mean, he is, I kind of like to think when he speaks, he's got flecks of spittle just coming out of his mouth like a madman. Okay. And then he pulls out his ace. But you, you know, how do you, how do you sit with this riffraff? I mean, ugh. come on, you are high and mighty. We are of an order that we shouldn't have to deal with these people. Okay. And Gandalf says, well, okay, what do you want to take back? What do you want to take back from the last time I was here? He goes, no, 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 you misunderstood, and tries to qualify. And he finishes his speech, 582, and notice we're told, even in the mind of Theoden, the thought took shape like a shadow of doubt. He will betray us. He will go. We shall be lost. In fact, we're told that none who stood within hearing was unmoved. Everyone was moved. Aragorn's kind of like, come on, get down, stand firm. Now, you can be moved two ways, right? You can be moved to be convinced, or you can be moved like Gandalf was. He laughs. Sarah man, Sarah man, skipping a bit. I am beyond your comprehension. What did Gimli say to Eomer when they first met, 
You speak of that which is beyond your thought. In little wit excuses you. Gandalf says, you, you can't understand me. Think of that, what that word, understand, it's a metaphor. It is literally a metaphor, the one word. What does it mean? To stand under, that is, to support. He says, you can't understand me. Oh, I'm so far above you. Okay? So, they keep talking. Gandalf offers him a second chance. Come on down, give us the keys of Orthanc. If you're good, we'll let you go, etc., etc. Bottom of 582, I'm giving you a last chance. And he says, yeah, if I give you blah, blah, blah. Sarah Man goes back inside, 583. And Gandalf pulls out his ace. And what's it look like? Come back, Sarah Man. I did not give you leave to go. I have not finished. You have become a fool, and yet pitiable. You might still have turned away from folly and evil and have been of service, but you choose to stay and gnaw the ends, that is, the final threads of your old plan. You still think you can win here. That is, Sauron might win, but no matter what happens, you won't. Let's assume Sauron wins. What's What's Sarah Man's role going to be in Sauron's new world? At best, a slave. Yeah, at best. So, what does Gandalf do? I am not Gandalf the Grey, whom you betrayed. I'm Gandalf the White, who has returned from death. You have no color no. now. I cast you from the council. And his staff breaks. And Sarah Man is broken in that sense. I cast you from the council means I cast you from the White Council. Well, it's probably what it means. It might mean something else also. When his staff is broken, he's no longer a wizard. He can no longer do magic, so to speak. The only power he has left is what? His words. His speech. He can give a really good speech. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. I have... No idea we were going to finish. <sighs>